Well, hello, Avid Readers. Trisha Goyer here, and I have my friend Candace Cade here. I'm going to have her tell you about herself. But first of all, welcome, Candace, and tell us who you are and all the things. Thank you. I'm so excited to chat with you. Yeah, so my name is Candace Cade, and I was born in Ohio, but when I was four years old, my family actually moved to China. And so we lived in a couple different parts of China, but ended up settling down in Chengdu, which is the capital of the Sichuan province. And that's really where I consider my home. You know, I lived there up until I graduated high school. And I attended a local Chinese school part time and then was homeschooled part time. And then, yeah, that was all the way up till high school. And then for college, I moved back to America and went to college in Oklahoma, then moved to College Station down in Texas for grad school, then moved to Austin for work, then moved wow. back to China, this time Beijing um, for more work, which is actually when I wrote Enhance, my debut novel, and then back to Austin. And I just recently moved to Oklahoma City. So I feel like a lot of authors, you know, in their bio, they have all these cute pets. And I really wish I had one, but we just moved too much. And I love travel too. I love traveling internationally and domestically. And so, yeah, unfortunately, I do not have any pets. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about where I'm from. Um, I'm married. I have two sons. One is two. One is eight weeks. Yeah. So he's fresh, um, pretty tiny little guy. And then, yeah. Um, I love that so much. Yeah. That's a little bit about me. Awesome. So cool. Okay. So the first time I'm going to have you tell about your books in a second. The first time I met you, you had actually talked to my husband first. I think mm -hmm. it was at a convention at one of the booths. And my mm -hmm. husband's like, I came back. He's like, you have to meet this lady. She is so cool. You're going to love her. You're going to want her to be your friend. She writes books too. She likes to travel. You have to meet her. And then we just kept like missing each other. And we finally connected. And I'm like, he knows me so well. Cause I'm like, yes. You're right. I love her. She's awesome. She's Aww. amazing. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was so much fun and getting to meet you. I think it was a homeschool conference. Yeah, homeschool that conference, was really yeah. cool. I think I immediately downloaded your, um, it was like how to survive as like a busy mother's guide or something. Oh, yeah. I only have two and I'm like, I don't know how you do it. Find time to ride <laughs> and homeschool and all the things. Yeah, it's it's a balancing act, but it's so fun. It's like being able to do all the things you love. So mm -hmm. um, and now you have two little ones. That's so awesome. Yeah. And writing. And let's talk about your book. So you have a new book that just came out called mm -hmm. Hybrid. Um, but mm -hmm. the one before that is called Enhanced. And mm -hmm. they're a set. But tell us about just the general idea, because mm -hmm. this is story world and these interactions between naturals and enhanced and hybrids and all those interactions. So tell us like, first of all, the story ideas and then then kind of like that world that you created around it. Yeah, oh, it's so much fun. And it's definitely inspired by my time growing up in China. Mm -hmm. And prior to going back, I'd written a lot of fantasy. I never thought I would write sci fi, you know, even when I was writing it, when I was done, people were like, Oh, so you write sci fi now. And I was like, Oh, I didn't even think of this as sci fi. <laughs> like to me, I, and I guess it is, but it's more of like near future. There's no spaceships or anything like that. Right. But yeah, it's young adult sci fi. And it's set in the Asian Federation in the year 2123, where everyone has these amazing genetic enhancements that are sort of like superpowers, right. at least everyone who can afford them, right. And so in the society, everyone is split very sharply by those who have have these incredible mm -hmm. enhancements mm -hmm. and then those who are too poor to afford them and so the main character urban she was born naturally she doesn't have any enhancements but then is adopted into the enhanced elite society and she has to hide the fact that she doesn't have any because that'd be really dangerous for her and her family and of course, that becomes more dangerous when she enrolls in Peking University and she's targeted by a hacker. And so there's futuristic AI games, motorcycle races, love, social credit scores. But ultimately, this is a story about a girl trying to find her place in a world where your DNA really determines everything mm -hmm. about you. So that's Enhance, which is book one in the series. Yep. And then book two, I won't give spoilers, but I'll just tell you that the themes in that are um, taken to the next level. There's also a lot about family. We also get to explore the Western Federation a little bit more. Um, there may or may not be some sci-fi futuristic Texas scenes. Um, mm. But yeah, so that's hybrid and that's book two. And it just released last week, actually. 
It's so cool. So what I love, well, there's so many things I love, but first of all, if you have a reader that's like, want something interesting fast paced like there's creatures mm -hmm. with like there's wings and there's like all the all these types of all these different things but then there is like the social status talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that too because there's social standing which i'm like this is so our world but not our world like it's like everyone just ranks each other but we don't like there you could see their ranking here we just kind of rank each other and like this is important people these are the influencers and it's just like you're giving a glimpse kind of like of our world, but you're doing it in this futuristic thing. So it's like almost you're making us more aware of kind of the things that we're doing naturally, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I think the whole premise is based on just several technology trends that I saw. I used to work in tech. That was my day job. Mm -hmm. And so it's just looking at these tech trends, like the concept of where do these genetic enhancements come from is based on real technology that exists today, CRISPR. You know, if you research that, you can see that, well, we're definitely not to the point where people can breathe underwater or have enhanced strength or intelligence. I think think that to a degree, not those levels, but to a degree that is what's coming with CRISPR. And mm -hmm. so just making people aware of that. And the same thing with like the social credit score, like that's something that when I was moving to China at the time, was something that was being talked about a lot of them potentially launching that. And I think we already see levels of that, like you said, with social media, you know, you have influencers and how many likes do you have? And I don't know if you remember, but there used to be something I think it was called, uh, I'm I'm blanking on what it was called, oh. but it was a tool that you could see your own score. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I was like, yeah. oh, I, I used to have it. I'm like, I used to have a really high weight gain. Yeah. Like, what is this? What yeah, is this? I, oh. I forget what it is, but I remember yeah. I was in grad school at the time and them doing some case studies and saying, yeah, like certain hotels will treat you better if you have a higher score and you need like customer assistance. They're going to go look up your score before they help you. And I was just like, that's wild. Like what? What are we? And I think that program has gone away because so many people are like, this is wild. But I still think, you know, we have levels that we have degrees of that. We have, um, you know, a credit score and we mm -hmm. have all these different scores in our lives. Um, and so for the concept of enhance, it was like taking all those scores, your credit score, your social score, wrapping it into one. And that's kind of your your social your social score. And it, I, it determines everything. Yeah, so, it's so interesting. yeah, go ahead. yeah. So I think it's just a lot of trends and even AI, you know, looking at AI and trends there and just seeing, you know, what is our world going to look like 100 years in the road, 100 years on the road, if CRISPR and AI and social credit scores, if these things were to take place. Yeah, it's so, well, I think there are taking place. And so it's like, let's, let's see. It's just very revealed, like you could check someone's score on your virtual eye thing. Or whatever. I don't know yeah. how you plan it. Like you could see yeah. different things as the person's coming up before you but right um and also like there's a couple of questions about did you like living in china where did you like to live so people are very fascinated about that part of you which yeah. is very it comes into these books so she's like in the is it the asian confederacy? asian federation like, yeah she yeah, lives in new yeah. beijing yeah yeah so it, there's a lot of asian culture mm -hmm. asian names asian family the big family when they all get together is awesome and hilarious and everyone's personalities there um so what i also enjoyed about it it's like it's, it seemed very natural mm -hmm. which is also you live there like you you grew up there you said that feels mm -hmm. like home and mm -hmm. so i think if people like venturing into other cultures also they'll get that you you like it's the future it's science fiction it's kind of like us enhanced i guess in your in our own way with the social scores but then there is that asian culture part of it so talk a little bit about that because it did flow so naturally mm -hmm. it didn't seem like like if i were to do it i would research and then have like stuff inputted <laughs> i don't know you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. but you could tell you could tell and i kind of knew ahead of time that you grew up in that culture so mm -hmm. it just seemed very natural as part of the book yeah, I loved it. Yeah. And I think a lot of foreigners living in China, they went to international schools. And it was very bold of my parents to stick us in Chinese school. But I'm so glad that they did. Because that really provided us the opportunity to learn the language, make local friends, learn about the culture. And so when I came back to the States, it didn't feel like, oh, I've grown up in China this whole time, but I don't really resonate with the culture. I very much resonate with the culture so much so that it was hard at times because I felt like mm. I was Chinese, but obviously I, I don't look Chinese at all. Yeah. And so that was always just really 
tricky to navigate. That was the hardest part about growing up there was just, you know, showing up to Chinese school every day. And a lot of times people would stare at me because I was Mm -hmm. the only foreigner at our school. And so that was really hard because I felt like I should belong, but people oftentimes didn't treat me like that. And then, but it was hard coming back to the States on the flip side, because no one assumed that I wasn't American, but I didn't feel American at all. And adjusting to American culture when I hadn't been here most of my life was challenging. And so it's definitely something you see in the series is that urban sort of straddles these Mm -hmm. two lines of enhanced and naturals. And she's not really sure where she fits in. She's grown up with the enhanced her whole life, but she's a natural by birth. And she doesn't really feel like she fits in with naturals because she's never lived in the outskirts with them. And so it's so funny because people say like, oh, do you see yourself in this story? And I'm like, yes. But at the time when I was writing it, I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind that urban's struggle with these two worlds and these two people groups and cultures was so much what I was wrestling with because I was in Beijing at the time. And it was the first time I had gone back as, and not the first time, I had gone back to visit many times, but the first time I had gone back and moved and lived there as an adult. And it was really interesting being back, you know, growing up in China in the early, in the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, there's just a lot of things that didn't exist when I came back. Like technology was just starting to take off. I didn't have a smartphone growing up in China. And so coming back and then there's all this new tech. And of course, I don't know those words or how to say them. And I'm working at Dell, a tech company, you know, for my day job. And I'm trying to figure out how do I say all these words and, you know, work in my second language. And it was really challenging. But yeah, during that whole time, I was trying to figure out like, do I want to permanently live in China? Am I Chinese enough? Or do I want to go back Mm. to the States and live there? And ultimately, I did move back to the States, but it was a really hard decision. And that's, I think, pours into enhanced a lot sort of that cultural lens and just the even the struggle that urban has between these two cultures. Yeah, I, Kristen said, I love her name. So cool, which I do too. I'm like, I'm surprised this isn't a popular name right now. Like, honestly, it seems like it would be such a popular name, because it's so cool and edgy. And then yeah, anyway, I love it. But um, and I think people have said before, like your first novel is kind of like your autobiography that you just tell mm-hmm. in another mm-hmm. way. And this is definitely something that you've told in a super interesting, super like fast paced and the underwater, like her brother underwater scenes crack me up. Like, <laughs> her underwater. brother is one of my favorites. <laughs> I was a prankster growing up. So I think Lucas, who's a total prankster, is just my like way to continue doing pranks now that I've matured and no longer do them. <laughs> yeah, he, he is so funny. It's like you sometimes he's like drives you crazy. Like it's so mm-hmm. like a brother thing. It's like, oh my gosh, you're driving me crazy. But he's also cool. Um, so it's all these all these different elements of this world but also the internal stuff which you talk about and your struggles I think that's so much you can totally see it like just knowing a little bit of your story I'm like okay I could totally see why this is in this book but for those of we're talking we keep talking enhanced and natural and then hybrid is your next book explain what those terms mean for those like of course I know what they mean you know what they mean but explain for those who are unfamiliar with those terms in your books, what they mean. So the enhanced are people whose parents have purchased certain genetic enhancements um, before their child was even born and are able to give those to their children. And so there's eight main gene pools that these sort of enhancements fall into. And those are like flyers, people who have wings. There's supers, people with all sorts of super strength or size. Um, There's inceptors. Those are people who are able to read microfacial expressions and can, um, it feels like they can read minds, but really they're just interpreting expressions and they're really good at like negotiations and politics and stuff like that. Um, There's artisans who are really great um, with, you know, dancing or any sort of high hand eye coordination. Um, So there's all these different enhancements that people can purchase, but it's really become a thing that only the wealthy can afford. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's where you see this sort of societal divide between the rich and the poor. The rich have all the best enhancements. They have better immune systems better health. And so they have the best jobs in the world. And then everyone who's poor, they just can't compete anymore. They, um, are, their children are just born naturally and they're stuck 
working AI training jobs in the outskirts where there's pollution and there's just no, um, they're just sort of stuck in this lifestyle. And so those are sort of the enhanced and naturals. And then there's rumor of a supposed hybrid, someone Mm -hmm. who has these genetics where you don't have to be enhanced at birth, but you could actually be enhanced later in life. And you yourself could potentially even select those enhancements instead of your parents. So that's the, the rumored hybrid. The rumored hybrid that just might be what book two is all about. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. The title is called hybrid. Mm. (laughs) Uh, But again, I'm like, this is kind of what's happening today in society. I mean, there's people that have, that have the dance classes, they have the arts classes, they have the language classes, they have all the things that you're purchasing. Um, So it's like not genetically there, but it's pretty much. uh, And I even remember in high school, um, uh, one of my teachers, one of her friends, um, was cho- chose the gender for baby. And I remember that's the first mm. time that I heard of it. Yeah. Um, I said something about, um, she was like, I was at a delivery. I'm like, oh, was she surprised? And she's like, oh, no, she knew they knew that they wanted a boy. And so they had a boy. And I was just like, what? And this was when I was in high school. It's a long time ago. This is in the 80s. So there's things happening that I don't think we really talk about too much in this. So right. there's not all these enhancements, but it seems very plausible that this is something that could also be happening in the future, or maybe people have been working on it now. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, I think they just had the third like annual genome um, like summit or something where they're talking about these exact issues. And, mm-hmm. you know, this debate is raging in the scientific world. Like what is ethical? How far is too far? Because currently CRISPR is being used to treat diseases and um, doing a lot of really awesome stuff. But what happens when you take it to, you know, your children and start to change their genetics? What does that look like? And yeah, I, I love that you know about that and have heard it because mm-hmm. a lot of people just haven't even heard about it. And it's, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be a big thing in the next couple of years. I think so too. And, you know, then you're like, yes, I wrote about this before. <laughs> before. I called it. Yeah. I called it's it, so yeah. funny. People all the time when there's like an update on CRISPR or AI or even like the headset that Apple just mm-hmm. came out oh, with, they're yeah. like, it's your retina display. Like people are always sending me <laughs> articles and they're like, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, I love. Yeah, it's all the stuff like I could totally see this happen. Or the tattoos that 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 they have, the mm-hmm. scanner, all the mm-hmm. stuff. I'm like, I could totally see all this stuff yep. happening. <laughs> okay, so someone said they sound like great books. Gonna have to read them. Yes, and and okay. The cool thing is, the cool thing is, like all these concepts are really cool, but the writing's really good too. Like, mm-hmm. so I'm just saying that, and I'm super picky. Um, so it's not like you have all these ideas and then they just kind of fall short. Cause I've picked up books before that seem like they have like the good concepts, but they're not able to follow it through. But I mean, I'm able to follow it. I know it's happening. I'm engaged in the story. I'm worried about something that's going to happen. Like, so good job. Good job Thank with you. all that too. And just getting that. So going back, growing up in China, did you always know you wanted to be an author or when did you decide like, oh, no, this is something I want to do as a, cause you know, not everybody says, I just want to write novels and sit down and have these worlds in their mind. They don't, not everyone does that. Yeah. Yeah. I fell in love with writing when I was a teenager. Um, I think being homeschooled, we were just exposed to so many different Mm -hmm. things. And I love that about homeschooling. My mom would, you know, let us pick up guitar or try Mm -hmm. out soccer or, you know, do all kinds of different things. And so I really enjoyed reading and writing a lot, but I don't think it even crossed my mind that it was something I could do as a grown up Mm -hmm. as, or even as a kid, you know, starting to write a novel. Um, And it wasn't until I read Aragon and found out that that book was written by a 15 year old. And I was 16 at the time that my mind was just blown. And I was like, Oh, I could actually do this. And so that's when I started to actually seriously write up until that point, I had attempted a couple of novels, but I'd never finished. You know, I I was a total pantser, just got a couple couple chapters in and was lost, you know, Mm -hmm, wrote myself mm -hmm. into a corner dead end. And so I decided this time, I am going to write a novel. I'm not going to allow myself to write a single word until I've sat down and like thought through the plot. So I did that for six months. I just sort of brainstormed. Yeah, this was my first fantasy novel, just brainstormed. And then, yeah, sat down to write and it just felt magical to me. I just absolutely loved it and knew 
I'm going to be a writer someday. And so again, with the flexibility of homeschooling, my mom was like, okay, that's going to be one of your electives. If you want it to be like you, you can write a novel. And so I started writing it. And I also bought a lot of books on craft and publishing and very quickly realized, you know, <laughs> it takes forever for most people to get published. And so mm -hmm. I'm probably going to need a day job and, you know, uh, just figuring all that out. But what was cool was, um, even though I figured out, okay, this is probably going to take me many years, I promised myself, my future self that I would never give up on getting published until I think it was I had received like several hundred rejection letters. Um, like it was it was very clear to me. I was like, okay, I'm not I'm not giving up until mm. it's like obvious that that either this isn't for me or I'm just really not a good writer. But yeah, everything I'd read said, you know, if you keep reading and writing and you're persistent and you work on your craft, you will get there. And so, yeah, as a 16 year old, I decided I wanted to be an author. And ever since then, it's been figuring out how to get published. I love that. So I, I think persistency is being persistent is like the thing. Because I remember when I first started writing, I was 22. I was pregnant with my third baby. I was like the young mom and all, all the things. Oh, that's I'm all there my, with that's you. That's all yep. my testimony, my story. But the cool thing is that once I went to my first conference and they're like, oh, no, you can do this. Read these books. Do this. Write the proposal. It's like I just like, okay. Like I never thought it wouldn't happen. It took much longer than I thought because it always says but I kind of knew it would take a while too but just showing up and I remember the people that I met and there was some that were like way better writers than me I was mm -hmm. like I had just written I'd been writing for months like I'd always I love reading but I had only been writing for a short time and I show up at this conference and want to learn and all the things but they weren't persistent and even though they were way higher at level I was the one that just kept showing up and kept showing mm -hmm. up and checked out the books at the library and mm -hmm. subscribed to Writer's Digest magazine and kept doing it. And I think I love that. And I see that in you too. It's like, okay, this is whatever it's going to take. I'll rework this. I'll do this. And so I love that you just set your sight on that journey. So how long from that time you're like, okay, this is something I want to do till you like are pitching this book and, and thinking that this is going to be the one that's going to get published? Yeah, about a decade and a half. Yeah, because yeah. it took me about 10 years to write the first novel. And I think that was one of the most discouraging parts was just, mm. well, not write it, I should say, edit it, rewrite it, you know, because everyone mm -hmm. says the first novel, you learn so much, and it's true. And so I probably should have just shelved it and moved on to the next thing. But I, I loved that novel. And so I wanted it to work and, and someday it will, but I just had to keep learning and keep mm -hmm. writing and mm -hmm. rewriting. So that took about 10 years. And then, yeah, Enhance was so much faster because it was my second novel and I had learned all the hard lessons I feel like at that point. And it's interesting because you said you started writing like when you had kids and when you were pregnant, which most people are like, that's a terrible time to start writing. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's really hard. And I kind of feel the same way about Enhance because, again, when I was in Beijing, it was one of the most difficult years of my life working mm -hmm. in my second language. Um, you know, I didn't know anyone moving to Beijing. So mm. starting over with friend group, I was doing long distance with my now husband. Um, I had a sports injury. It was just a really challenging time. And work wise, not only was I exhausted just from working in my second language, but also, the work environment in China is really long. They have a saying, um, Jiu Jiu Liu, which is 996. You work from nine in the morning to nine at night, six days a week. And that's pretty normal in tech and in corporate. Thankfully, I worked for a foreign company, so it wasn't quite that bad, but it was exhausting. And that's when I started writing Enhanced. <laughs> you know, I'm like looking back, I'm like, how did I write the first draft? when I was in Beijing for less than a year, like that's just wild to me. But I think sometimes, you know, you're just able to, when it, you have these hard situations, you just somehow make time. So yeah, it took me about a year to write Enhanced and then another two years to edit it before I felt comfortable pitching to Enclave. Mm -hmm. So cool. And I think part of that is that for me, it's a creative outlet and it's, it's like, I'm like, people are like, how do you write all these books? It's the easiest thing I do. Like I'm mm -hmm. taking care of my grandma who's bedridden. I have 10 children, mm -hmm. homeschooling. There's a house. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I have a deadline. Guys, I'm going to go write for the next hour or two hours. And it's like I get to be creative. And yes, it's a challenge to like, get the words on paper. But if that's like who God created us to be, this creative mm -hmm. storytelling people, then it is more of an outflow, whereas the laundry is just 
laundry. <laughs> like for the kids. With the yes. attitudes are just yeah. kids with attitudes. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, I totally relate. I think that's definitely what it was for me when I was in Beijing. It's just like I'm so exhausted in every single way, but this one thing is so life-giving to me that I have mm-hmm. to do it every day. So good. Okay. So you talked about pitching it to Enclave. Mm-hmm. How did that journey go? The it's, publishing journey. Right. It's funny because earlier you mentioned, oh, Enhance has all these cool concepts, but I like that you can actually write. That's almost the exact feedback that I got from Steve when I pitched to him, but he was skeptical. So I pitched to him and he said, <laughs> yeah. you know, he pitched and he, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And he's like, I love the concept, but how do I know you can write, you know, send, mm-hmm. send me your manuscript and we'll, you know, we'll see. Um, but so, yeah, I pitched to him and several other publishers and, you know, all of them wanted my manuscript. And so I was so excited and it was funny because I was actually just pitching um to get feedback on whether my pitch was working I was planning on getting an agent and then um going that whole route and I wanted to know before I started entering the long and arduous querying trenches whether my pitch was working and so was totally blown away when I actually got a book deal from Uncle <laughs> yeah, I love it so pivoted and um yeah ended up signing a three book deal with them and then Enhance came out last year Hybrid just came out and I'm working on book three right now awesome all right so is that gonna be out next year yes next year yep and is it due soon it was due soon. I may or may not have asked for an extension thanks to baby number two and the move number two. It just, yeah, it wasn't happening. So I recently just asked for an extension <laughs> on the book that was due. Oh, it's actually due in four days, but it's not going to be due in four days. I asked Steve, so Steve's my editor too, for a book two of the one Nathan and I are writing together and I asked for an extension. And then we happened to be on a separate call thing that we do. Um, with a group and he's like you were the third author in a week <laughs> that asked for an extension now i know it's at least it, yep yep now i wonder <laughs> who the third was the uh, you can private message me and tell me you were the third one but it's, i hate <sighs> asking for extensions i know um, but, me too yeah, caregiving and all the things has just made it hard but yeah Yep. I feel you. We can start a little extensions club. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Steve, for all your graciousness. He is so gracious about it, though. He was like, you know, family comes first. Totally understand. I was like, thank you. This will never happen again. Then again, this is the end of my contract. But if I sign again, this will never happen again. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I know. It's just it's and and it is life and it is hard. And we do have deadlines and we try to meet them. But yeah, stuff comes up and we're just doing our best. But yeah, I love that. I love that um, just having a publisher that you know you can trust them and like the covers are great. The editors, they did such a good job on your stuff. And it's great to know that for your genre, it's like the perfect publisher to be at and it's exciting. Yeah. And they are so amazing. Like even the typesetter, like let me put Easter eggs in the typesetting or in the cover, you know, work with the cover designer to put those. And I'm like, that's amazing. How many publishers would let you do that? And I love that so much. Yeah, we just got the typesetting a couple weeks ago for our mm. set releases in June. It's so cool. I love it. I so, can't wait to see it. It's so fun. Okay, so you are working on book three. It's going to be in really soon, Steve. I promise you it's going to be in soon. So do you have ideas for the future or what are you going to do with that? Oh, I have so many ideas and I don't know which direction to take it. I have so many sci-fi ideas, but I also don't want to be just sci-fi. I don't want to be pigeonholed in that. I also love fantasy. I also have a contemporary series somehow um, partially written. So I don't know. And I love screenplays too. I used mm. to be in screenplays. I did some time in LA um, in the film scene. So I don't know. There's so many ideas. That's that's definitely something that I'm thinking and praying about right now. Which direction yeah. to go? Mm-hmm. My thing always, because I'm the same way. Well, because I write all the things too. I was like, okay, what is the one project that it, I would be really sad mm. if I didn't get to have published before I died? I mean, that's kind mm. of a morbid question, <laughs> but it has, it has guided me well. Right. And it might be the most, the, what, the most random thing will pop in my mind. And I'm like, okay, hmm. I can do that. Like, and so anyway, that's something to prayerfully consider as you're considering. Where yeah. To go yeah. I'll have to try that. We'll see. Yeah. All right. So where can people connect with you? Uh, first of all, Highly recommended. Go check out these books. If you like interesting characters, situations, intrigue, there's all kinds of questions that are posed. So if you like this kind of book, 
go, good writing. Go check it out. But Candace, where can people go to connect with you and to find out more about you and the books? Yeah, they can go to my website, CandiceCade.com and sign up for my newsletter. Will they find out more about um, upcoming releases? I also give away a lot of arcs and fun stuff and behind the scenes, the Easter eggs, all that sort of stuff in my newsletter. Um, or I'm pretty active on Instagram and that's just Candace Cade author. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. And it's, and I can't wait to see that little baby someday. I want to see that little baby. We see the little baby. So yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll be meeting up sometime. Yes, we'll for see. sure. Thank you so much for having me, Trisha. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll connect again. Thank you. Awesome.